This is Bob Fetrakis in the studio with my original co-host, Connie Goodell Newton. This is The Other Side of the News. We're streaming live on the Free Press Network and at WGRN.org. And on the radio at WGRN LP FM 94.1 and WCRS LP FM 92.7 and 98.3. And hatred to mankind Poisoning their brainwashed minds We're back, and uh, Connie's in the studio uh, to bring us up to date on some important legal issues. She is, in fact, a licensed attorney here in Ohio. Uh, Welcome back, Connie, to the other side of the news. Thank you, Bob. It's great to be here. Um, Yes, I am indeed a local defense attorney here in Columbus, Ohio, and I wanted to come and talk with your audience today about collateral consequences of a criminal plea. So as everybody knows, when you enter a guilty plea in a criminal case, there are consequences to that. You could have jail time or probation or a fine. But um, many people don't know about the what we call collateral consequences. So uh, some people may be disqualified from holding certain jobs. They may lose their professional license or there may be deportation consequences for immigrant clients. So that's something that uh, criminal defendants need to know and that their attorneys need to know. Uh, Many attorneys, unfortunately, are not well versed in the consequences on your immigration status if you enter a certain plea. So um, I had a recent rare uh, success um, on a case where there was a young man about 19 years old uh, out of Shelby County and his attorney pled him guilty to uh, a charge which would result in mandatory deportation. So this young man was a lawful permanent resident, lived with his parents, um, worked, you know, went to school, uh, uh, very Americanized, and um, unfortunately, um, his attorney pled him guilty to a charge that was um, it was um, unlawful contact with uh, a minor. So, uh, kind of uh, a plea down from statutory rape. So, the young woman in the case was 14 or 15. He was 19 when this occurred, teenagers make mistakes. Um, And it seemed like, you know, for all intents and purposes, like that it was a pretty good plea deal. Unfortunately, the attorney did not realize that it had the consequence of mandatory deportation. So, um, you know, his immigrants, after serving 30 days in jail, so he was sentenced to 30 days, it was a misdemeanor, um, did his 30 days, and then ICE picked him up immediately and started deportation proceedings. So his immigration attorney uh, called me frantically. He had um, tried to reach many other defense attorneys trying to find somebody who would take this case. Nobody would touch it, but I knew that this was the kind of desperate situation where even if we were very likely to fail, because these uh, motions are uh, usually not successful. It's actually very difficult to withdraw a plea. However, it is possible. Um, It's called a Padilla motion. So the Padilla case is a well-known case where someone pled guilty uh, to a charge. They had ineffective assistance of counsel. So their counsel said, you know, that uh, it shouldn't have an impact on their immigration consequences or didn't really advise them of that. Um, And so we were able to withdraw the plea. So it is a very high standard, a high bar to meet. um, But I was able to show based on the transcript in the case that there was ineffective assistance of counsel. Um, Basically, the attorney said that he had discussed the possibilities with the client and that deportation was unlikely. And so he said that on the record and we were able to get that out of the transcript. Um, So I filed a motion um, in the Shelby County Court to withdraw the plea, and uh, it was a pretty urgent situation. So uh, after I filed that motion, called the prosecutor to let him know what the situation was and what I was trying to do with the case. Basically, 
um, I was able to negotiate with the prosecutor to change the charge to a different first degree misdemeanor that would not result in deportation. So we, uh, we were able to agree on a first degree simple assault uh, with two years of probation. Um, that's not considered an aggravated felony for, deport for immigration purposes. Um, so basically, um, at the state level, we have our own way of classifying different offenses, but at the federal level, they look at it, they have their own schema for how they classify offenses. And since he had pled guilty to a sexually oriented offense, uh, it was considered a, an aggravated felony. So that's something that can have um, deportation consequences. All right. So uh, was this specifically because it involves sex or moral turpitude? Um, yes, there are, um, there are certain crimes that involve moral turpitude, and theft is one of those cases as well. So a, a theft charge would be something that would involve mandatory deportation. Uh, and again, what else are the categories we should be looking for? Um, so moral turpitude and aggravated felonies. Um, and moral turpitude cases, so like theft, may not be automatic deportation, but it can impact uh, a person's ability to apply for citizenship or to re-enter the country. So there are various uh, consequences that defense attorneys and clients need to know about. And so I would just advise individuals, if you're not sure if your attorney really understands immigration law, you need to consult with an immigration attorney. Um, and basically, in order to withdraw the plea, there does have to be ineffective assistance of counsel, and it has to prejudice the case. So it is a, a fairly high bar to meet, but it is possible to do. Um, so I would just um, advise clients, uh, if you have questions, you may need to consult with an immigration attorney or uh, you know, make sure that your defense attorney knows what they're doing. Uh, for defense attorneys, that material is out there, um, and you know, I would just say don't make promises that you can't keep to your clients. Make them, uh, you know, do their due diligence in, in, in consulting with an immigration attorney if you're not sure. But there are a lot of materials online that discuss crimes of moral turpitude, that discuss aggravated felonies, and what types of charges the federal government is looking at when they make those determinations. So... Sometimes it's very difficult when an attorney practices at the state level and they don't have that federal immigration experience, but there are resources available. Um, and I would just say that, you know, as attorneys, we need to make every effort that we can to protect our clients' rights and to make sure that, um, you know, we're not getting them involved in something that's going to have unintended consequences. Um, another thing that I would add is that uh, prosecutors are advised that they're supposed to take immigration consequences into account uh, char uh, during the phases of charging, plea negotiations, um, and other phases of the case. So they are supposed to um, look for uh, immigration neutral consequences. Um, they can be fairly creative with how they do plea deals and um, find something that will not have immediate consequences of deportation or you know, other, other impact on the client. All right, and uh, was this a, this was a state case, but it had federal implications. Yeah, that's right. So a lot of times people don't know all of the implications that a plea is going to have. So there are certain, um, certain charges and convictions that may make you lose your professional license. So maybe you won't be able to teach or be a social worker, a real estate agent, or an attorney. Um, and so those are all things that you need to keep in mind if you're charged with a crime, if you have a professional license, if you have a vulnerable immigration status, those are things that you need to keep in mind and discuss that with your attorney. So did you get any resistance from the local prosecutor on this? You know, it was uh, very surprising, Bob. Um, out in Shelby County, they were very 
cooperative and easy to work with. So I will say kudos to them. Um, we had a great judge, Judge Stevenson, in the case, and the prosecutor uh, was cooperative and seemed open to um, to opening this, uh, reopening the case. And I would just say, um, you know, part of that is that I think I was able to reassure the prosecutor that we weren't necessarily trying to get the case dismissed. We were not trying to try the case. Um, we were basically trying to keep it at the same level, um, you know, maintaining the, maintaining the defendant on probation because I assumed that was what the court might want out of the case, um, you know, giving due respect for the victim in the case, um, you know, just making sure that um, basically that all sides got what they needed out of the case. So this was a case where there was, um, you know, there people make mistakes and there was something that happened. However, a young man in that kind of situation shouldn't necessarily get deported. Um, the country where he was from, there are a lot of human rights violations um, that happened. He was from the Philippines, so we know that Duterte is, uh, you know, doing summary executions of drug users uh, in the Philippines. So, um, you know, not that not that he was on drugs, but just that he would he would be deported back to a situation where he didn't um, necessarily have family. Um, all of his family was in the United States. So this had a lot of consequences for him if he would have been deported. Um, it could have, you know, it could have actually been a death sentence for this young man. And so that's not what anybody really wants um, out of a misdemeanor. You know, he did his jail time. He was willing to do probation. Um, you know, he, he made a mistake just like many young Americans and teenagers can do stupid things and make a mistake. Um, and he was uh, willing to try to make amends for that, but he didn't deserve to be deported. And how can people get a hold of you? Um, well, they can check out our website. It's fgnlegal.com, and that uh, stands for Fitrakis and Goodell Newton. So um, uh, we are law partners. And full disclosure. Yes, law partners. full disclosure. We've worked together in our law firm for about 10 years, and um, I've worked with Bob actually for about 12 years since I started working with him at the Free Press and doing election law in the 2008 election. So it's been, um, it's been a very good long partnership. And um, so check out our website, fgnlegal.com. You can uh, call our office at 614-307-9783 if you need to speak with an attorney. Um, you know, if you have this type of issue, definitely consult with someone. And you just got done watching... The other side of the news. Thanks, Connie. Thank you. If you appreciate our work here on the other side of the news, please click the like button below. And don't forget to click the subscribe button and that bell symbol so you're notified when we post new stuff. This kind of feedback helps us keep you informed. Thank you. This was a swift, precise military strike that has huge unpredictable and possibly long-term consequences. The target was one of Iran's most senior leaders. Hassam Soleimani was in a convoy at Baghdad airport when it was struck by three American missiles in the middle of the night. His death will send shockwaves through the Middle East. Iran is now threatening a violent retaliation. This temporary joy of the Americans and the Israelis will not last long before it turns to grief. The Islamic Revolutionary Guard Corps, the people of Iran and the front of resistance throughout the geographic latitude of the Islamic world will take revenge of this proud martyr. A Pentagon statement made clear that it was President Trump who gave the order for the assassination. A Pentagon statement made clear that it was President Trump who gave the order for the assassination and why. General Soleimani was actively developing plans to attack American diplomats and service members in Iraq and throughout the region, it said. General Soleimani and his Quds Force were responsible for the deaths of hundreds of American and coalition service members and the wounding of thousands more. President Trump, normally so expressive on Twitter, posted a simple image of the Stars and Stripes without any comment. The US Embassy in Baghdad has this morning urged all U.S. citizens to leave Iraq immediately.
This was an act of war. The Americans assassinated a senior Iranian military official, a, a person who was uh, a war hero in Iran and also a person who helped save Iraq and Syria from ISIS. And uh, the same is true in Iraq. The Iraqis will also be seeing this as an act of war against Iraq because the Americans also assassinated a senior Iraqi war hero and commander that works under the Iraqi prime minister. So there will be severe consequences. The assassination comes days after protesters in Baghdad attacked that embassy. The violence was triggered by US airstrikes on the Iraqi border, which killed two dozen Iranian militia. In response, hundreds of extra American troops were sent to Iraq, and President Trump promised to retaliate if necessary. Washington believes that Iran is severely weakened through harsh sanctions, and this will harm them further still. Last night's strike, whether planned or opportunistic, would have been calculated with that in mind. Well, that, you know, it seems to be destabilizing and... I mean, like, and, and yet, yet yeah, another like they favor success. Obama. Obama was able to cut a deal right. over the enriched uranium. Mm -hmm. it, these things were solved diplomatically using, uh, you know, uh, John Kerry. Ah, uh, diplomacy is overrated. <laughs> I mean, and, and what's Trump do? I mean, mm -hmm. Trump's response, he doesn't come on and solemnly explain why we had to kill the second most powerful man in Iran, what, what was with which the, is conceived the, to be an he, act of war. Instead, he tweets an American flag. Yeah, what? what that's what I was just going to say. What's with the tweeting the flag? What does that mean? That's, what is it supposed hey, to say? if you don't know, you don't need to know, <laughs> Mr. Dugan. <laughs> if you can't figure out... It's a grand old flag. flag. It's a high-flying flag. <laughs> Uh, long man America, wave. Uber all us. <laughs> Uber all developed. Okay. Indeed. Don understands German quite well. No, I, I had heard about him tweeting a flag, but I wasn't, I, I forgot to look that up too. I didn't do my homework on the, on the flag. So, well, I don't know, what was that about? It just, seriously. It, so it's like an image of a flag yes, on he, he the tweeted. Twitter site? Yeah, and, uh, he sent out a little... Is it like know, an emoji icon. or something? Like, yes. Here's a flag. Here, have a flag or two. I've just put us on the brink of a major regional war. Sure, why not? With a country that's two and a half to three times as large uh, as Iraq. Why not where live we, a little? Where we still are and where we've sent 14,000 additional troops under Trump. Hmm. And just the other day, right, the... Uh, again, the whole tit for tat. I mean, they knocked down one of our drones, right? Because uh, uh, we were spying on them. Right. And they showed it off, and then they attacked a few tankers, mm -hmm. and then uh, you know we responded by bombing. Well, they. So, what, do we expect them to retaliate, and then we're even for a while or something? Yeah. Well, the the problem. <laughs> I mean, th this is one of those. I push you. Hey. You push me. There you go. <laughs> and then I, I feel you, better. Right, as opposed to... <laughs> I guess. I guess. Yeah, that's what I was no saying. Contract. It's like they killed right, a contractor, like, and we killed the leader yeah, of their now, forces. Now, now, this is sort of like when I used to live in Detroit and moved out to Rufford, and, and a guy pushed me, and I punched him. I didn't understand the diplomatic rules of engagement right, well, there you of go. suburban high schools. Yeah. You push no, me, I you. push you, right. and then we wait for guys to grab us. Mm -hmm. I was thinking about... Oh, let me go. Sean Connery in The Untouchables when it's like, you know, they take one of the others out and you take two of theirs out. You know, that kind of, that kind of macho stuff. So, well, by the way. Neither side had taken so, really anybody out. Uh, you know, I mean, this is an Iranian. It's not an Iraqi. Right. And obviously we have no idea what might happen. So maybe someone else out there does. I mean, what would meantime, we do if they took out Michael, Michael Pence? We would hardly notice. So in the meantime, a new free press has hit the well, uh, hit the uh, newsstand. The, the new free press has hit the newsstands. R Roberto, is there anything you'd like to uh, share from the new free press? That, well, uh, it's looking perhaps... at uh, Donald Trump's uh, promises, many of them uh, broken, uh, and really looks at a lot of policy issues where people in Ohio are actually doing much worse, and also points out that Trump 
has dropped about 19 points in favorability since he won this state by eight or so points. Uh, He's down 19 points. In 19 okay. points. I mean, polls are polls. That, that means but that uh, that's a big, Ohio's that's a big back one. in play. Right. I would think so. Depending on who he runs against. If he runs. Well, because we still have the impeachment going on. Do you think that well, they run. might follow your advice and hold on for a while and, uh, you know, maybe until March or something on the... Uh, well, uh, to proceed with the impeachment? Who knows, but everything's political and everything has to do with his re-election. Right. Including, I think, the assassination of the number uh, two guy in Iran. Okay. Uh, I, I think he's drawing from Karl Rove, right? Uh, so just so you're, so you're, you're going to go back to the, the, the polls, right? Okay. Like uh, George W. Wagged Bush was yeah. uh, after the 82 election. Uh, the media asked uh, Karl Rove is, how could Bush possibly win? And he said, well, he'll be a war president. They're like, yeah. there's no real war going on. You got Afghanistan, but nothing's really happening there after the original invasion. And then what do we get in 83? 2003. 2003, not, not 83. That would be yeah. uh, his dad. take 20 years there. 2003, what do we get, of course? The attack on Iraq. Uh, and it was Karl Rove who said, no sitting president has ever... Uh, failed to win re-election when there's a hot war going on. Okay. Anything else in the free press you'd care to discuss, sir? I'll have Christianity today. I, I know thought that was one of the topics house. for the show. So the Christianity. Christianity. Well, yes, I today was reared in a story. Catholic environment, and we all know how painful that can be. Well, uh, you know, the, the Christianity today found, uh, started by uh, the Reverend Billy Graham uh, had a that great editorial uh, some of our listeners have heard about, but people really need to read it. I mean, essentially, they go, look, this guy's tweets speak of everything, lies, mischaracterization. So you've got an evangelical born-again magazine founded by Billy Graham essentially saying, look, our president's a chronic liar of low moral character. Even the evangelicals. Yeah. Yeah. Well, uh, at least uh, that one uh, evangelical. But uh, the vast majority of the white evangelicals aren't budging, right? They're, they're down with Trump. Trump's their guy. Yeah, yeah, he was. He was uh, Cyrus or something like that, yeah. Well, I like to, uh, you know, and he's got these supporters. In fact, uh, Franklin Graham, uh, Billy's son. Uh, Franklin, drug, yeah. drug is right. went to the grave. Exhumed the body of his dead father and really? dug him out and said he loved Donald Trump, even though uh, Billy Graham himself I was a that. registered when? lifelong. Well, it's when figuratively he dug up the bones ah. and exhumed the body. Wow, I But he that drug his was... dad in and claimed, you know, his dad who died Lazarus. at the age of 99 mm -hmm. uh, a year or so ago. He said, yeah, he was a supporter big, of Donald Trump. Big Trump trumpeter. I yeah. think he liked the fact. I think what Billy liked, and what Franklin failed to say, he liked the fact the sex with the porn star. Sex with the porn star. Well, let's let's go down that road for the last minute of the show. I don't think so. Well, it is a new year though, and I hope everyone is going to be able to put behind them their past mistakes, and look forward with hope, joy, I peace, let us hope love. The president doesn't assassinate any high-ranking officials among regional powers. Because that would be a true other side of the news. Here from WGRN, the Green Renaissance. Streaming to you from the Indie Media Studios of the Free Press Network here on YouTube, but also available online at WGRN.org. Plus, listen to us on Columbus, Ohio's two volunteer-run low-power FM radio stations, Fridays at 5.30 p.m. on WGRN 94.1, the Green Renaissance. And Mondays, 5.30 p.m. on WCRS 92.7 and 98.3. Hi, I'm Bob Petrakis, Editor-in-Chief of the Columbus Free Press. Free Press Network began fighting against the oligarchs in 1970 with the Columbus Free Press newspaper. The paper started on the Ohio State University campus as a reaction to the Vietnam War and the Kent State killings. Columbus Free Press is one of the oldest independent, investigative, activist papers in the United States. 
We were the first Western newspaper to expose the killing fields in Cambodia, to get a reporter behind the scenes at Wounded Knee, and we've outed neo-Nazis. We were the first gay rights paper. We cover police brutality and government corruption. We lead the current election integrity movement. Free press reporters and volunteers investigated the theft of the 2004 presidential election. We have been exposing the vulnerabilities of electronic voting machines through our reporting and books ever since. We've documented the names of more than 2 million voters deleted from the Ohio voting rolls. Many of them re-registered when we made those lists public. Our congressional testimony and lawsuits have served to contain voter fraud and preserve democracy in our country. Building on decades of telling truth to power, we have developed the Indie Media Center of the Free Press Network. Currently, we publish a monthly newspaper, two websites, two community radio stations, WGRN 94.1 FM and WCRS on both 92.7 and 98.3 FM. Now a video podcasting the multimedia studio provides the new media soapbox that the Central Ohio community needs. Reporting workshops and training is available for budding journalists and content makers. We are strategically located in the capital city of the United States' key battleground state. Remember, as Ohio goes, so goes the nation. We need your help to keep muckraking journalism alive in the heartland. Help us fight against fraud, corruption, and injustice. You can keep the Free Press Network growing with a one-time donation or become a monthly patron. We have a variety of benefits set up for almost any level of support. Help us comfort the afflicted while we afflict the comfortable.